Excellent. Um, so glad to be here for the next 25 minutes or so, because it's a topic that I've been personally track, well, tackling with for the past past year or so. So, like, how do you build a really, really self-organizing team and maximize your efficiency? So, maybe to start with the entire discussion, I'd like to ask Krista. Uh, you're building one of the fastest growing, com growing companies from over here that has scaled amazingly in the past four years or so. So, like, why, in general, why do you think that this way of working, like a very bottom-up way of working, is the way to go? That's an excellent question. And we work in an industry that is developing extremely rapidly. Yeah. We serve some of the largest online advertisers and the most demanding online advertisers globally. And at the same time, we work with Facebook, who is innovating faster than I think anyone else in, in that industry. So because of that industry, we need to maximize our product development speed. And I believe that the only thing to make it happen is to have decision making on the lowest possible level within the people that actually knows exactly what the problems are doing and can implement and solve those problems, especially in software. And that's why, that's why I think it's, it's essential to not to build any bureaucracy or any hinders to decision making and keep keep the decision making and the autonomy within the teams. And what was it when you had the first time to start thinking about this actually, like how do we work? So it's interesting, this is for startup and we failed miserably with all the others. And then when we found product market fit with, with Smartly in 2013, already at that point we were working with the clients in a very similar way than we do now. And I think that was the sole reason why we were able to found, find product market fit and make our customers extremely successful even in the early days. We had full stack teams working together uh, cross-functionally from sales uh, and development and building, building things straight with the customers and making decisions every day about what to build and what to ship. How about Nicholas? Um, you have Blinkracy working at the moment, but when was it for you? that you needed to start thinking about how you actually work together? That's a good question. Uh, I think so the first two years we were, grew from four founders to 20 people. And I think this time everything is, you don't need to think that much about culture or organization because everyone is just doing everything. But as soon as you start growing the team and you have like three to four new people joining every month or every quarter, um, you realize that you have to do a better job really communicating the way you work and the way you want to make decisions to the new people. And I think for us, very interestingly, is like one thing we learned is that culture, it develops if you want it or not. So there's some kind of like routines, habits, and decision-making processes that are in place that just develop through the way you interact with each other. And if you don't really codify them, document them, it's pretty hard for new people to understand how you actually want to operate. So we, once we started growing and realized that like, there was a lot of unclarity for new people, how we actually want to run the company. We started really looking, going step back, saying, how, what are actually our values, what are our principles, and really write them down and make them part of the onboarding process for every new employee. And is there something you would d do differently now if you would go back those three years or so? Um, I think, yes, I would think about, um, I think I would, would think about like writing down values and principles much earlier and spend much more time during the onboarding of a new employee to really explain the values, explain why they developed in a specific way, way and probably even give more examples how they can be applied in the day-to-day -day life instead of just assuming that everyone just will get onboarded by themselves by just observing how the company works. Right. Vishal, um, before Obvious Ventures, you were at Patagonia, which is probably, you know, if you look at 10, 15 years ago, already back then the leading company in working this like a very mission-driven way. So how on earth was it possible that a you know, big company with thousands of employees was able to work with such a like, well, focused on the mission? Yeah, so Pat Patagonia is a great example of a company uh, with uh, a very authentic purpose and an aligned culture. Uh, if you look at uh, Patagonia's purpose, it's about building the best product um, with least harm and, and using business to inspire solutions to the environmental crisis. 
So the, the purpose has been designed in a way that first portion of the purpose um, is going to keep you in business, which is building the best product. And then second portion of the purpose is why are you doing? Why are you in business? Mm. Uh, so there is means to the end, and end is solutions to the environmental crisis. Um, and, and, and what is very important when companies are starting, pur purpose or authentic purpose is all about what people are thinking about in an organization. Why are they doing what they're doing? Yeah. And so it should reflect that. Uh, and, and also, when you are hiring people, you should be hiring people who believe in the culture, uh, the, yep. the purpose which uh, is getting cemented, right? Um, most important is, is at Patagonia was that you are always walking the talk. A lot of companies like will put posters all across, uh, you, you know, the company, but that doesn't really do anything uh, because uh, it's not authentic. So, so Patagonia was a great example of like uh, alignment of authentic purpose and aligned culture. And could you give an example of what it, that then in practice is if it's not like posters on the wall, but how does it come to life when decision making, being at the office? Uh, so if you, if I if I take the first portion, which is making the best product, uh, Patagonia has, ha has had a history of innovating around that whole idea with the least harm. Um, so they were in 1980s, they decided uh, that uh, cotton was not, uh, had, had a really negative environmental footprint. And so they moved the whole business towards organic cotton. Uh, they uh, came up with, um, uh, this, uh, they innovated using soda pop bottles to make fleece. They, when they're opening up uh, a store, they try to rehab an a old building so that it's a gift uh, given back uh, to, to the community they're serving. Okay. Um, you know, if you think about uh, their catalogs, they are designed in a way uh, that, uh, that people are not only buying from it, um, it's, it's like a magazine they want to read. So a lot of these things happen at, at the company which are aligned with this idea of, of uh, you know, build the best product with least mm -hmm. harm. Similarly, if, on the other side, which is the, uh, the kind of using business to environmental crisis, uh, the, the company uh, gives 1% of revenue and 10% of profit, which is a, whichever is higher back to environmental causes. Uh, they have launched a whole non-profit called 1% for the Planet. Um, they've inspired by this whole uh, vision or purpose, they, they came up with a very successful advertisement campaigns, campaign in Thanksgiving, do not buy our jackets, uh, which uh, for a commerce company is an interesting idea. So, uh, so, uh, so the key message here is that all your actions should be reflected in, in, in alignment with what your purpose, uh, purpose is. Yeah. Next up, I'd like to spend the time on the like, founding blocks for this self-organization to work. Like the culture, the people, the communicating the clear purpose. And maybe actually starting with, Christo, you've written one of my favorite pieces on ser servant leadership. Actually, each and every one of you go, should go and check that out on Smartly's uh, website. Um, one of the things you wrote there was about like how your leaders, team leaders, need to be very, very aligned with the purpose and where you're going. But so, how do you, in practice, make sure that all the leaders within your team are aligned? What what do you do on a weekly or a monthly basis to align everyone? So, it's a huge question, and you can put it to to different pieces. But everyone needs to first of all, everyone needs to understand the the mission, the vision we have to make online. The growing customers online, easy, efficient, and enjoyable. Everyone needs to understand that that's, that's the core and what it means in practice. Then the second is that everyone needs to, everyone we hire needs to believe in that. It needs to believe in that mission, but needs to also be able to work and understand and enjoy our culture and our way of, ways of working. So it doesn't matter whatever you do after, if you fail on these two things, I think whatever you do, how well you do document, what processes you built, it doesn't make any difference, you'll fail. So those hire and, and then 
people believing in the mission and that being widely understood. But then after that, I think for us as a leadership team and, and uh, uh, the, all the team leads, the, the core is to help everyone else to be successful. We always should have a better person to do sales, mm. coding, marketing or something else within the team. We always think about hiring to elevate the team, not to delegate things. So then the role of team leads and us is the building the infrastructure, building communication structures, building documentation, building data where people can see how they are doing. And that in, in practice happens by many ways. One is that every Monday morning we gather the whole company in our eight offices in different time zones in US, Asia and in EMEA. We gather together and we talk about the context and the topics and share our learnings. On Friday we do the same. We demo what has changed in our product and then our salespeople gives feedback. And after that session, yeah. the salespeople and developers get together to solve those problems because developers build something that salespeople are not able to sell or understand or vice versa. And then it goes on and it goes on uh, on, on a high, half annual levels. We, we go for an off-site for a week, the whole company somewhere, hopefully warm, uh, <laughs> where we where we share all the learnings and build the processes, how we do sales, how we code, how we do marketing, how we, how we hire, all of this. So it's, it's a lot of, it's very far from self-organizing in a sense that you have a huge <coughs> infrastructure supporting that. But then the teams can actually focus on what they do best. And we, our leadership's role is to equip the teams. Yeah. There's a question here that I would have taken anyways next. Uh, Nicholas, maybe you can start, but feel free to comment afterwards. So a lot of talk about hiring the right people, but so what do you exactly do in the process of hiring the people to know that they will fit? Or do you fail many times? Yeah, I think it's pretty hard to really say 100%, to be 100% sure when you hire a person, if the person will fit, because I think there's like just so much information you can acquire during an interview process. But I think there are some, some techniques you can use or processes you can use to get to a level of confidence that you say, okay, I'm able to make this decision. Um, so while we, we spend a lot of time really making sure that the person fits the culture and has the same beliefs as we have and is really buying into our purpose as a company. So I think the first step is always kind of like making sure that the person has the experience and the skills that are needed. And we spend a lot of time really nailing down the qualifications and the criteria that we're looking for before we actually start hiring so that we can really say, okay, this is what we need. Does this person bring this? And once we get a good feeling about the experience and the skills, then we spend most, like two thirds of the, the hiring process, then it's really cultural fit. So we kind of like really use our values in mind and ask questions around to understand, is this person believing in, in self-organization? Is this person believing in transparency? Do this person have examples from previous jobs where they really champion transparency or self-organization? Um, all these things and really make sure that we have a feeling, okay, this person is not only like um, believing, but as well like has shown in the past that they keep up these values. And then the last that we have a day at Blinkist, so we fly in every person that we um, want to hire. So the last round is always at, at our office in Berlin. So we never hire over Skype. And then the person comes in for like a round of interviews, meeting different people from different teams so that we get a lot of perspectives. And then we have a, a decision round where everyone who was involved in the interview process uh, comes together and shares their kind of like feedback on this person. What's important though is there's always one decision maker. So it's not a consensus decision in the end where we say, okay, 50% yes, 50% no, but like one person's making the decision in the end, but it's taking all the feedback from all the other people into account and then come up with a like, decision if we want to hire the person or not. And then the second part, which I think is important is, so you have a probation period of three to six months, for example, and you should really use this as a trial phase and really understand this as a trial phase. So making sure that the person gets up to speed as soon as, as fast as possible, but as well be very honest and have like a lot of feedback loops within the first three months and see, is this really working out? Is this person fulfilling our expectations or not? And if not, then, oh wait, then you should part ways very, uh, very soon and just like go back to the hiring process. Other tips for Vishal? Yeah. I think, uh, especially for entrepreneurs, I think when you are starting a, a new company, uh, if you are three or four founders, uh, basically you are from day one, whether you write it or not, you're building a culture, right? And, and then good entrepreneurs, they make sure that first 50 people, they are interview interviewing themselves and they're hiring the best people who fit with that culture and that 
purpose they uh, the journey they are, uh, are on on at certain point uh, the the culture becomes so solid uh, that uh, in case of patagonia that if somebody d was not excited about outdoors was not into environmentalism would not fit or would not even you know send their resumes or for some reason if they got in the company within two weeks they'll realize like they don't fit here because uh, because it had a uniqueness to it right so the, the, that's what uh, successful organizations do really well um, and and so i i think i'll encourage all the entrepreneurs sitting here is to think about their culture from day one as they are thinking about their product market fit because that's what's going to help them scale their company right christo what have you learned from from hiring <laughs> fully agree on all the points and either help to scale or fail the company and i love the words that whether you put effort or not building the culture the culture builds itself yes but you can adjust and you can uh, you can build a culture systematically and i think the culture uh, as, as many famous people have said, but culture is strategy for breakfast. And it's the most important thing because that defines really how you work with your customers, how you build the product, how you, how you work together with your, your people. And uh, every culture is unique and you need to be able to build it to make your company successful in the environment with the people in the company. And uh, hiring is the most important important thing and uh, I think there is no such person in the world that would not do mistakes with hiring. It's impossible. The amount of var variables that you need to take in account in, in your personality versus the company is, is so huge that you can't not know in beforehand whether it works or not with full certainty. I think we are getting better I think we are at 85-90% uh, hit rate in a sense that, that they are culture fits. And that's exactly the reason why we, for example, wrote our culture handbook. We, we document it for the people that are thinking to work at Smartly, whether this is the right place or not. And the best outcome is that someone comes and tell that Smartly is not the right place. I shouldn't waste your time. I shouldn't waste my time applying. But people very often don't know. They don't understand what makes them to drive, what makes them efficient, what in what environment and what with kind of people, what kind of people they enjoy the work. So I think that's the hardest part in an interview process to, to try to, to understand that uh, both ways. I think uh, one more point I, I want to make is uh, a lot of times, again, entrepreneurs focus on, hey, this person is a rock star and, and has uh, an amazing credential, uh, but they forget I think, are, is this person passionate about what you are doing, right? So it's important that you give more credit to whether the person is going to, you know, drink, eat, sleep with your mission in mind. And even if they are like 20% less than that rock star, I think you will do much better as an organization if you, you, you hire those kind of folks. Absolutely. Yeah. One pattern we found is, uh, what we try to look for is like people with a growth mind mindset. So it doesn't mean that the person has like need to grow as a person like really ambitiously, but I think they need the belief that they can develop themselves and not kind of like, okay, this is who I am and I can't improve in any area. So we try to really kind of like, like you can call them rock stars or whatever, but so just people who think of themselves that they can acquire new skills, that can learn new things and they as really as well and of yeah. course like really taking yeah. the challenge and yeah. grow. And on a more concrete level, we also talk about humble, hungry hunters, and that's really the profile. And, and you need to be very humble to, to get feedback, to, to learn from our customers, from the colleagues, from the industry, because otherwise you'll, you'll stop developing. And then you need to be extremely smart uh, on selecting the right fights and be able to manage yourself. And it's it's really hard combination. It's it's really, really hard combination that, that can survive and drive, because you need to be... You, you need, we bring the data available, where the industry is going, how we do on product adaption or, or on sales or something else, but then the people within the teams need to pick that data, that context, mm -hmm. and set their priorities mm -hmm. and, and drive those priorities forward, and not even within their own team, but cross-functionally. So they need to sell actually the idea to other functions, other, other people, gather that group together, let them to drop whatever they were working and prove that this is more important. So that's th those kind of people. It's, it's really hard to find, and they are 
I mean, they are cold, gold. They are humble, hungry hunters if, if we are able to find, but it's, it's really, really hard. Yeah. I, I am going to take those three H with me. <laughs> it's Humble, excellent. Hungry, I like it too. Yeah. And hunt. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's quite a lot of questions uh, from the audience on holacracy. And to end this discussion with, I'd really like you to share the experience that you shared with us when we met last summer on like how you tried it out, what didn't work, and where are you uh, now? Yeah. So I think I just like to try to explain it briefly. We wrote a couple of blog articles about that. So if you want to go deeper, you can do this later. So we got very inspired by the idea of self-organization through discovering Holacracy, actually. And um, I think 2014, we experimented with Holacracy, implemented it, and kind of like something we called Blinkracy, which was a Holacracy library say, we take the best parts. Um, we don't take everything, but we take the best parts and make it kind of like use, apply basically the basic principles of Holacracy. And it kind of worked well for one and a half years. And then we, kept, we started growing as a team and realized, OK, actually, Holacracy is creating more problems for us as a team, then it actually solves. And one of the main issues we found around Holacracy, although the basic concepts are pretty good, I think one of the problems is that Holacracy is a concept and a brand name at the same time, which means that everyone is, can Google Holacracy, and there are like 20 blog articles, and every blog, blog article describes Holacracy in a different way. So what suddenly happened is that everyone had a different understanding of Holacracy, and probably did a poor job on onboarding people on the system, so that people were I think the main point where we realized that we have to get rid of Holacracy in a way, we have to do something different, is I was sitting in a meeting and we were discussing. So we were discussing a, about a problem and people were asking, how do we solve the problem with Holoc or like in Holacracy instead of saying, how should we solve the problem? <laughs> and this was like, OK, so I think the system <laughs> became way too dominant. Um, the this, this system must go. Um, so we went back saying, OK, what are the principles of Holacracy we, we liked? For example, self-organization, transparency, having roles instead of job descriptions, um, all these things. And we said we keep that, but we put it into a new framework, which we call the Blinkist Operating System, which is basically a set of values, a set of guiding principles, and just like a really handful of core processes, how you create a role, how you create a team, for example. And that's what we set as a framework, as a foundation. And then we leave, the we leave the rest to the team. So they decide how we want to organize. They can do governance. They can do tacticals, what Holacracy recommends. But they don't have to. It's like really up to them. Um, so I think for us, the big learning was here is that it can be very tempting to take like an out-of-the-box solution, because it's, it seems to be really easy to, uh, to, to apply. But actually, you think, should think, like, and this, like we said, it's like you have to create your own culture. So you should think, what's important for me? and then put it in your own words, control the narrative, and then do a good job on onboarding people rather than just saying, yeah, read this blog article, read this book about holacracy, everything is ex ex explained there. <laughs> I think it's not working. No. We're out of time. For the audience, each and every one on the stage, these guys have written awesome pieces on how they're building their companies <coughs> or what they're seeing as investors. So yeah. please go and check them out. You're going to learn a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.